that became then the, the wisdom for the day. Now, most of them are geared towards, a lot of them, I should say, towards babies. How do you know if you're pregnant? How do you know if it's a boy or a girl? So here's like a list of things that if you have morning sickness that's really bad, well, it's, it's going to be a girl. If mom's carrying the baby one way or another, it's a boy or a girl. So you can go through all these things and you have heartburn. Well, no, then it's a boy. Women, <laughs> I guess girls cause heartburn. I don't know. Uh, do you have a, a craving for sweet things or sour things? Well, if it's sweet, it's a boy. If it's sour, it's a girl. And so you can tell, you know, what kind of baby you have by going, are these true or are these false? Now, it's interesting. Um, things like this happen in the spiritual realm. That's why Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 7, have nothing to do with old wives' tales. And that's what he calls them. The New American Standard says, worldly fables fit for only women. On the other hand, discipline for yourself for the purpose of godliness. And you say, well, what has this got to do with our lesson at hand? We looked last week why, and asked the question, why are there so many churches? Because we saw that by studies, there are some 33,000 different groups claiming to follow Jesus Christ alone. But we saw last week also, you could assuredly know that the Lord has just one church, His church. It was built by Him. It is His church, and there was only one. And we also learned that it was his body. And as the body, being the same thing as the church, we learned that there's only one body. And therefore, since the body's the same thing as his church, there's only one church. And so in contrast to the world, and there are many ideas about the church and Christianity, there is truth and there's a lot of wives' tales, aren't there? Things that are floated as true and People become very confused, and someone might ask, well, why is it so important we have this discussion? Well, because if we are convicted, and we know that Jesus has only one church, then the question is, how do I become part of that church? How can I be sure that I'm part of his church? Because we're going to show this morning, it's only those that are part of his church that will be saved. Because my job and your job, I'd suggest, is not to examine all 33,000 different groups. You'd spend the rest of your life doing that, wouldn't you? And it comes across as kind of judgmental, doesn't it? And it comes almost self-righteous, like, I'm going to find out what's wrong with every group until I find the right one. No, our challenge is just to listen to Christ as he's spoken to us his word and just do what he says and find his church. Because I would suggest if you just... Follow what he says. You can know confidently, assuredly, you're part of his church. And that's what we want to demonstrate this morning. And so the weight should come off your shoulders. I don't have to find out about all those groups. I just got to figure out for myself that I'm part of Christ's church. I don't know about everyone else in the world. But I can know, assuredly, beyond any shadow of doubt, that I'm part of his church, his body. And therefore, I'm going to be saved. Now, I just got to say something. A lot of times people, when we have this discussion, and they're listening, whether in the audience or hearing us talk about this outside this building, oh, you guys think you're the only one saved. Did you hear me say that? Did I suggest that? What is my suggestion? You can know assuredly that you're saved. That's the only one you can be confident about. You cannot be confident about anyone else. A hundred percent, because each one stand before God and give an account for their life lived on this earth. I can't know whether you have the faith that saves or not, because I don't know your heart. But you can know yourself that you are part of Christ's church, that you're saved. And we would never say we're the only ones saved, but we will say we know we're saved in Jesus Christ. We are Christians and we're Christians only. So that's what we want to do. We want to look at how I can know that I'm part of his church. How I know that I'm going to heaven. Because that's the confidence he wants us to have, is it not? We have to dismiss with the wives' tales that come out spiritually. 
Now, to do that, we're going to first look at some amazing facts about Christ Church that you know and maybe you didn't, but we just want to go through them briefly. Then we're going to look at the idea that all the only spiritual blessings that you, uh, of salvation and, and forgiveness, the only place they're found is in Christ. Because thirdly, he is the savior of the body. So we'll look at then how you can become part of his body. And that's where we'll finish. But think about some of the things that we've read about Christ church. And we'll just go through them very quickly. Acts chapter 4. There's no other name given under heaven by which you must be saved. And that's Jesus Christ, isn't it? Jesus himself said, no man can come to the Father but through me, because I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, that's amazing for a man to say that, but if that man is God, the creator, it's not that amazing, isn't it? But the implications are profound. If you don't believe in Christ, if you don't follow Christ and become part of Christ, there's no way you can be saved. Salvation's only in him and in his name. Then we look in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, where Paul calls the Ephesians elders, and he warns them to uh, guard themselves and be on guard for themselves and the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made them overseer to shepherd the church of God, which, is, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, I just got to stop there. The church was purchased with the blood of Christ. This is amazing, but it's true. Now, you might have a nice car. What's the most you probably could pay for a car in the United States? You know, average be under 100 grand, right? If you really want to go crazy, you could spend 150, 200,000, some of the extreme sports cars, upward a million, right? But if you had a $100,000 vehicle, shiny, you wouldn't want Dave to touch it. You wouldn't want anyone to even, because you, you don't want any scratches or anything. What's more valuable, that $100,000 car or something that somebody gave their life for? They bought it or preserved it with their own blood. And that's why Peter said, you were redeemed, not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ that a life was given for you and me so we could be saved. Not anyone's life, but the creator of the heaven and the earth became flesh so he could shed his blood so he could buy you. That's the extreme value you and I have if you're in his church because it was the church that was purchased. It was the individuals in the church that were bought with blood. If you're outside the church, you have not been blood bought. But you can know assuredly that if you're in Christ's church, you've been purchased with his blood, you're redeemed from the world, you know you're going to heaven. It's nothing could be more exciting than that. We see in Ephesians chapter 1, we'll look at this, and it was read for us by Jordan, that in him, in Christ, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now that's very profound. It's amazing that not only do you get blessings when you're in Christ, you get every blessing. But we're going to suggest, we'll look at this one more detail, if you can be in Christ, you also can be what? Out of Christ. Just like you have to be in his church to be blood-bought, you have to be in him, in his church, to have spiritual blessings. Outside, there are none. There's no access to any blessing spiritually. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 22 and 23, that God made him his head over to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills on all in all. This is amazing that we know God is a spirit and spirits don't have bodies of flesh and blood. Jesus tells us that, Luke chapter 24. But Jesus yet still has a body, does he not? What does he say is his body? It's the church. Now, I don't know about you, I take great offense by people that come up and want to harm my physical body, because there's an intimate connection between who I am, we say we're a spirit, aren't we, the real you and real me is a spirit, living in a body, but yet there's an intimate connection between me and my body, so if you step on my toe, I'm going to be upset, 
And if you punch me in the face, I'm going to take offense because you are attacking me when you attack my body. Are we all pretty much the same way? So afterwards, if I don't quit on time, your body is going to be talking to you louder than I will, saying, I'm hungry. Tell Jack to shut up so I can get out of here. Isn't that right? We nourish and cherish our body because there's that intimate connection. This is what's amazing, but it's true. Christ has a body. It's not physical. It's made up of people, those who've been blood-bought and are in his church. And you can know you have this wonderful relationship with Jesus. It's so personal. You can't get any more personal. You, are make, you make up his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And he'll take great offense if anyone tries to harm you, just like you take offense when someone tries to harm your body. And just like you clothe your body, you nurture it, you take care of it, he loves and nurtures his church, his body. He has this special relationship. Well, why is that? Because we're going to see in chapter uh, 3 that this church, which is the manifold wisdom of God, was eternally planned. God had this plan before he made the world that he would save those that are in the body of Christ, the church. And because of that, we see in chapter 5, we'll come back to this one in verse 23, just as the husband is the head of the wife, Christ is the head of the church, himself being the savior of the body. This is amazing. God's going to save someone. Jesus has already committed eternally in his plan to save the, his body. That's all he's going to save. He's going to destroy all the world, all the beauty that we see in it, all the uh, created beings, all the mountains, all the flowers, the seas will all be burned up. And the only thing that he'll take from this world that he created in all its beauty are those that are in his body. He is the savior of his body. Now, you can be in his body or you can be out. If you are not in his body, you will not be saved. There's no assurance that you can have that salvation is yours. There's none. And if, if God's going to save you, he has not told us that he would do that. He's not indicated he'd do it. He's not even hinted that he would do, he would do that. You are taking the biggest risk of your life spiritually forever by choosing to stay out of the body of Christ. But on the other hand, if you know you're in his body, <laughs> you know you're going to be saved because God would no more cut off his hand than you would. And if you're part of his body, he will save you in the last day. In chapter 5, Ephesians, not only are we part of the body of Christ, I want you to open and see this. He loves us. Just like you love and nurture your own body, as we referred to earlier, we feed it, we clothe it, we bathe it. Well, that's the way the husband's supposed to treat his wife. And the example in which he uses is Christ and how he loves the church. Verse 28. Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body, because he who loves his own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Christ loves us like you would love your own body. He's looking to nourish you and to cherish you, so much so in verse 25, husband, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and even gave himself up for you to purchase you, that he might sanctify you and cleanse you by the washing of the water of the word so that he can present to himself the church in all the glory with no spot or wrinkle. Now he's going to continue to be with us. And so when we're presented to him, we'll be perfect in every way. That's an amazing thing, to think that we'll be the bride of Christ in all our glory. Well, there is some amazing things about us, the church. And I'll finish with this one in Hebrews chapter 12, 
where he says, you haven't come to a mountain that cannot be touched, but you have come to, and he says, the assembly or the church of the firstborn, and I'm pulling one thought out of that. He says, those who are enrolled in heaven. I want you to think about this. If you are in Christ's church, which is his body, if you're in his body, if you are blood-bought, you're the one that are going to be saved. You're being nourished and cherished by Jesus while you remain on this earth. Your name is written in the book of life. You are enrolled in heaven. And God promises us that if we're faithful and we continue to follow Jesus, he will never erase our name out of that book. We can know confidently that we're going to heaven if we're in the church of Jesus Christ. It's just that, it couldn't be that simpler. Now, let's flesh this out and make sure we understand it by looking at two of the ones we mentioned already. First of all, the Savior of the body. Because when we think about this, the Savior of the body, here is the idea that you cannot, how do I say this? If Gary is in danger because he's out there ice fishing and the ice breaks away and he starts to you know, disappear into the water and it's so frigid that he's going to get hypothermia and he can't swim because the water's so cold, what's going to happen to Gary? He's going to die. And you might say, no, Jack, you were already taught the real Gary is his spirit and his body is not Gary, and so he will live on, but his body will die. Is that technically correct? But so are you just going to let him drown when you have the means to save him? No, you're going to get in a little boat and push it out there or throw a life ring or a rope or a stick, and you're going to get him something to drag, grab on so you can pull him out of that water because he can't save himself, and then you're going to save his body, aren't you? And by saving his body, who are you saving? We understand that. Christ is going to save his body at all costs. That's you and me. He is the savior of the body. Now, we know the body is the same thing as the church. And we know there's only one church. Because there's only one body. Christ doesn't have multiple bodies. So if you're in his church, you're in his body, and he's going to save you one day. There's no doubt. There's no way this could be wrong. And that's what we have to understand. Now, again, if you can be in the body of Christ right here, you also then can be out. And that's the concern. We want to make sure that we know that we're in his church, his body. Because if I'm out, there's no chance of me being saved. Another verse we said we would come back and look at, and that's the one in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Again, I want you to open your Bibles to that, because this one is so simply stated, but it's so important for our consideration. Paul begins this lengthy prayer in uh, blessing God for all that God has done for us. In the Greek, the prayer starts in verse 3, and it doesn't get done until about verse 11. Um, Verse 13, excuse me. And he starts it with the whole premise, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you might ask, why bless God? Well, because he's blessed us. You see that? I'm so thankful to God because of what he's done for me. Well, what has he done for us? He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing that are in the heavenly places, the spiritual realm, that, and they're in Christ. Now, what we're going to see here is that if you want access to any spiritual blessing, they're all where? In Christ. Now, first, we're going to talk about the word all. That's 100%. And I'll ask the obvious. How many does that leave out? None. Now, physical blessings are for believers and non-believers, people that are good and people that are wicked. The sun shines on the crops of the wicked person, and the water rains and uh, causes his crops to grow, as well as the good person, right? People all over the world have health, and they enjoy physical riches, and they have children. These are all blessings from God, right? Physical. But a spiritual blessing is non-physical. 
It's reserved only for those that are in Christ. And you might ask, what is then a spiritual blessing? Well, he's going to list a couple of them. Look in verse 4. Just as he chose us, where? Where did he choose us? What does it say in the text? Everyone see that? In him. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. Now, so there's two blessings right there. And I want you to consider those things. That in Christ, the first thing he says is, you've been chosen before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, he predestined us to the adoption of sons. We'll put these two together. Here's the plan. So, um, Jack's feeling uh, pretty uh, um, um, giving today. He just feel, have that good attitude. He just wants to bless everyone here. So he decided a year ago, no one knew this, that whoever comes to services today, he's going to give you a $1,000 gift uh, certificate to Costco, our favorite store. <laughs> so everyone that's here. And so at the end of the service, at the door, you get your gift card, your certificate for a Costco $1,000 gift card. Now, who's he going to bless with that? He made a decision a, thousand, uh, a year ago that whoever's in the building on November 5th, 2017, is going to get 1000 bucks. Did he know who was going to be there by name? No. But did he know who he's going to bless? Who's he going to bless? Those that are in the building. Now, we could say that's us. We're the chosen ones. Why could we say that? Because we chose to get here, and we didn't even know he's going to do it, but we're the chosen ones, aren't we? So pick up your $1,000 on the way back. Gift card. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> Isn't that what Jesus did? Before the foundation of the world, he made a choice. Now I want you to suggest, understand, he didn't choose people by name. He chose those that would be where? In Christ. Now who can get in Christ? Anybody. Anybody. Like anyone could have came this morning. Now the difference between what Christ did and what Jack did, Jack kept it a secret. Jesus is inviting everybody to get in him. He says, I'll purchase you with my blood. I will make you part of my body. And I will take you to heaven. I will save you. And I'll do that because I'm going to make you holy and blameless. Holy as God is holy. That's an amazing thing. Because I know when you look at yourself, because I look at myself and like, I don't see myself as very holy. My struggles in the flesh, we all sin and we fall short. Paul himself prayed three times that this thorn in his flesh should be removed. We don't feel very holy, but in Christ we are because of what he did for us. Because God can't have a relationship with anything that's short of perfectly holy. But in Christ, we are holy. That's a spiritual blessing. And we're also, we're blameless. They say everyone has baggage, don't they? You come to a marriage with baggage. Well, you come to Christ with what? Baggage. But it, it, what, you know what happens to all the bad things in your baggage? It disappears. So Donna's smiling at me. She's got her baggage spiritually, and I look around. I'm trying to, oh, look at that. And she goes, put that back, all right? Can I do that in all of your lives? Pull something up you don't want other people to see. Outside of Christ, yes. In Christ, you're blameless. There's nothing that can be pulled up by Satan and anyone else that people go, ooh, because it's all perfectly in order, holy and isn't that beautiful? It's amazing to think in Christ we are perfectly pure. Not because of our own behavior, but what he's done for us. I'm going to heaven if I'm in Christ. Because I'm sinless. He said, really? What happened to my sins? Well, notice what he says in verse 5. There's adoption son through Christ. And then in verse 6, he says there's grace that was bestowed on us where? In Christ. And he says, in him, verse 7, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses. If you're in Christ, what do you have? Forgiveness. Of what sin? Every sin. And we know in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, stay in Christ, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his Christ continually cleanses us from all our sins. Every day, every moment, every second of every day, I'm pure, I'm forgiven, 
because of what Christ is doing for me. He loves me and he nourishes and cherishes me. Now those are spiritual blessings. They're found where? In Christ. And we also have an inheritance in verse 11. Now, those are the saved people. But if you can be in Christ, you also can be out, right? But we're trying to establish first that you can have all the confidence in the world that if you're in Christ, you're going to heaven. Because it's not about what you're going to do. It's about what God's doing for you. Just like if you did get that gift certificate from Jack, did you do anything to get it? No, he's doing it for you. All you can do is say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I made that a story up just to make sure. Because <laughs> there's someone that's going to go up to Jack after and say, where's my gift certificate? <laughs> All right, I made that up. But that's a wife's tale, but what we're reading is true. Since we know assuredly that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we establish that. We do know that he has a church which he purchased with his blood. We can know assuredly that if you get in his body, his church, you're going to be saved. There's no way that could be wrong. So the question then is, how do I get in? Because again, I have to emphasize all these blessings are where? In Christ. And we'll talk about that. Uh, Facebook, you, when you, you put all the information about who you are, your profile, it, some people say in a relationship, right? We speak about being in a building. That's geographic. But in relationship is not geographic, is it? But it's more spiritual. It's personal. When you're in Christ, it's not geographic location. When you're in his body, it's not physical. When you're in his church, the last thing you should think about, you're in this building. When you're in his church, in his body, you are in Christ. You're in a relationship with him. Spiritually, built on Jesus himself, because we've been purchased with his blood, forgiven of all our sins, we have the Spirit living with us, and we now have a relationship with the Father. We're in a relationship, a spiritual one where our name has been written down in the book of life, we're enrolled in heaven, and God knows you who you are, just like you know every parts of your body, Jesus knows you intimately. That's what it means to be in Christ. Now, either you're in Christ or you're out. There's no in middle ground, is there? This is a binary thing. It's just in or out. So the big question is what? How do I, because I don't want to be out any longer, get in? Isn't that the, really the question that we want to ask? And that's where we'll finish. Because we've already established, I hope you see it's clear, and we could spend another hour. If you're in Christ, you're in his church, you're going to heaven. If you're in his church, we're not worried about all the 33,000. We just want to make sure I'm in his church, his body, right? Then I know I'm going to heaven. And I want to share that confidence with others. I'll share them the same thing that I've learned. I will share with them so they can have that confidence. We're not here to condemn people in the world. We're not here to judge every congregation or denomination in the world. That's not our job. Jesus said, I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. And our job is to share that same gospel with others so they can know confidently, assuredly, they're going to heaven. And that means you've got to be part of his church, his church. Well, how do you get in? That's a fair question, isn't it? And we could spend a lot of time, but we're going to just give you the brief answer. I want you to look at three scriptures, and each one is going to emphasize the words in two. The first one is in Romans chapter 6, in verse 3. Do you not know, speaking to Romans, people who lived in the city of Rome who are already Christians, he's speaking in past tense because they already were baptized. But he says, do you not know all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus? You see that? How did they get into Christ Jesus, into his body, into his church? It says they were baptized. And that word means immersion in water. He says, you're also baptized into his death. 
In verse 4, we have been buried with him. That's Jesus through baptism. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. So here's the first indication, the first clue. You're baptized to into Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 in verse 20 or 13. He's talking about the unity of the church because the Corinthian church was so divided. And he wants them to be of one mind, one spirit, and, and agree on everything. No divisions. So he's trying to get them to see that you're part of one body and each member, which you are part of the body of Christ, needs to care for each other. So he says in verse 12, even as the body, the physical body, is one and yet has many members, all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Many members, but how many bodies? One. How'd you get in? For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. It didn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, slave or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. Now, that's important because who is the God or Jesus going to save? He's the Savior of what? The body. And here it says we're baptized into one body. Now, that would make sense because if you're baptized into Christ and the body is, you know, the church is his body, you would also get baptized into his body. The last one is in Galatians chapter 3. These are the only three places in all of the New Testament that speak about how you get into Christ or into his church or into his body. Verse 26, Galatians 3. You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. See, it starts with faith, doesn't it? Faith that Jesus is not just the man, he's the son of God. He died for your sins so he could purchase you from the world. And he lives now in heaven as your king. And he's coming again to take those that are enrolled in heaven home. It takes faith, doesn't it? But it takes faith enough to say, I'll take you at your word. And as king, I'll do what you say. And if you want me to get baptized, I'll do it. And that's what Paul says here. For all of you are sons of God, speaking about what they've already done through faith in Christ in Jesus. Christ Jesus. For, here's the explanation how that happened. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You put him on. And that doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. Verse 28, slave or free, male or female, you're all one in Christ. See, this is universal. Everyone gets into Christ exactly the same way. It's through a faith in him that says, I'll do what you say. And if you want me to get baptized... I'll get baptized into your body, into your church, into you. And so when you look at it, the only conclusion, and you can know, here's what I want you to understand. You can know confidently, surely, baptism will put you into Christ. You can know that. Now, there are a lot of wives' tales spiritually. Because people say, well, aren't you supposed to, what if you just called on Christ? What if you were sprinkled? Would that work? Because people are maintaining all sorts of things, right? What if water was poured on you? What if you were baptized as a baby? What if you weren't baptized at all, but you just said a prayer and asked Jesus into your heart? And they're all maintaining those will put you in his church. Now, our challenge is when you're talking with someone, and if I'm, you're one of those persons I'm asking you kindly, Just show us in Scripture where Jesus says that will put you into his body. That pray, you pray yourself into his body. That you're sprinkled into his body. Because you won't find it. He said, well, couldn't it be that he might save you that way? Well, see, too much is at stake here. I want to be blood-bought. I want to be rolled in heaven. I want to be saved. I want to be holy and blameless. I want to get in Christ. And I know baptism puts me in there. I have no kind of confidence that sprinkling will get me in there. So I'm not here to have to dismiss all those things. Let's just do what it says. Then you can know if you try something else, you have no clue whether that'll work or not. Right? No clue. No confidence. It's made up. It's a wife's tale. Say, well, couldn't God save you anyway? He can do anything he want, but will he? That's the question. Will he save that person? There's no assurance you can have that says that he will. You're just living your life on a hope, a dream, a wish, a long shot. You're playing the lotto with your soul. 
say, well, why baptism? Well, we already read it, that in Romans chapter 6, remember all of us that were baptized, were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were also baptized into his death. And through baptize, baptism, we were buried with Christ. And just as Christ was raised from the dead, we will be raised to walk in newness of life. So the gospel message is Christ died for sins. But what did we, they do with him after they killed him? They buried him. And he could not stay in the grave for one reason, or else you have, that is you'd have a dead Savior, wouldn't you? You'd have a dead Lord, a dead king. So God promised in the Old Testament scripture, Jesus announced in himself that I will raise from the dead on the third day. So we have the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's what makes salvation possible. You remove any of those three elements, you do not have salvation. Jesus is not Lord of Christ. And likewise, the way you become part of Christ's body is mimicking this exact same thing. Because he says, do you not know all of us that were baptized were baptized into his death? Because what do you do with sinners? You've got to kill off the old man. Get rid of those sins. Got to get them on the cross. And just as you died with Christ, he says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, you have been buried with Christ. See, by faith, you have to understand that when you were baptized, I'm talking to you that already have, you didn't just get wet. That's not what happened primarily. You have to understand in your mind's eye, at that moment, I am dying with Christ to my old sinful self. Verse 6, it said, the old body of sin was crucified with him. And what do you do with dead people? You bury them. You've got to be dead in sin to be, or in order to be a candidate to be baptized. You don't baptize saved people, you baptize dead, lost people. And you have to understand that you didn't just get wet, but you were submerged in water because what do you do with dead people? You bury them. With a leg sticking up? No. An arm sticking up? No. You bury them totally, a dead animal or a dead person. That's why we're immersed. That's what the word baptism means, in water. Just like Christ was sealed in a tomb, we're sealed in that water, and our sins, he says, are washed away. But you don't keep a person down there, or they will die physically. But just as Christ was raised from the dead, you are submerged in the water, and then you immerse or emerge out of the water. You rise again to walk in a newness of life. And there's what it is. It's a death, burial, and resurrection. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, when Peter preached the first gospel sermon, he preached Christ died for your sins, he was buried, and God yet raised him from the dead. And he's both your Lord and Christ. They were pricked in their hearts. They said, what should we do? And he said, I'll tell you what to do. In the name of Jesus, you need to repent because of your faith. Repent. Make him your king. And here's what the king wants you to do. He said, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So verse 41, it says, those that received his word were baptized that day, and they were added. What were they added to? It's interesting. This is probably the only time I'll ever quote the New Living Translation. It says, they were baptized and added to the church that day. See, they understand what happened. When they were being baptized, at that moment, Christ was adding them, or God was adding them to the body, his body. And then we find in, in verse 47, the Lord continually adding to their number. Day by day, those were being saved. The old King James says the Lord was adding to the church. So I'll just say this. You cannot join Christ's church. It's impossible. You cannot join and become be part of his body by being sewn on, like you could sew someone else's uh, organ transplant to your body. You have to be added to his body. You have to be added to his church. And God does the adding. You can't join it. When does he add you? When you die to the world, when you're forgiven, and you're raised up in Christ. That's when he adds you. When you're pure and holy at that very moment. And you can know assuredly that baptism, it's a death, a burial, sorry, girl, and a resurrection. 
And that's when you actually get into Christ. That's the only language that is used there. So when it's all said and done, here we are. I want to be enrolled in heaven. Don't you? I want my name written down in the book of life. And the Bible couldn't be clear of how that's happened. There's one church, right? The church is the only people that are going to be saved. He's a savior of the body. All blessings are in Christ, his church. And if you're out, you have no chance. And the only way the Bible speaks of getting into his body, in his church, is when, by my faith, I call on him to wash away my sins through baptism. That's when he adds me to his body. Now, I say all that because I just want you to know, you can have all the confidence today. I don't care how you feel about your past life or what you've done. You can have all the confidence in the world. You're going to heaven. Why? Because if you've done this, you are in his church, in his body. And just like the rain washes the dirt off the roof, his blood washed away all your sins when you were buried with him in baptism. That's why Paul, when uh, Ananias came to him, said, Why delay thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And that's what he did immediately. So as we bring this to the close, you can do a sure. Don't listen to all the voices out there. Don't gamble with your soul. If the Lord said what you need to do, just do it. And then you can know. And let me just say this. When you're sharing the gospel with others, let's don't get in a fight about what other congregation or denomination, excuse me, are doing. Let's just share what the Bible says. Because the truth always wins out, doesn't it? And you can have confidence if you just obey the truth. It's not about what everyone else says. It's just about what Jesus says. Let's just do what he says. Then you can know assuredly. Couldn't it be any simpler than that? And that's why Peter said, baptism now saves you. We're going to sing a song. And in the chorus, it asks one question. What will your answer be? Do you want to go to heaven? Do you want your name written in the book of life? you want to become part of the body of Christ, his church, so you can have all spiritual blessings? I guess the question remains, it's in your court. What will your answer be? Show it come if we can help you as we stand and sing. Someday you'll stand and